We are live. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad that you were able to join us. I'm Tara Wood, and I am an A-School teacher. I'm excited to be here today with author Jill Williamson. From her website, I can tell you that she is a chocolate-loving, daydreaming creator of kingdoms and the award-winning author of several speculative fiction novels. She got into writing one day when someone was complaining about teen books, and she thought, I can do that. So um, I'm excited to have her here and to listen to her presentation. If you have questions for her, we're going to uh, collect questions to ask at the end. So please take note of that number on the screen. You can text um, and let me know the questions to pass along. And Hello. Hi, Jill. Thanks. <laughs> Um, hi, my name is Jill Williamson. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm excited to talk to you guys about writing today. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to share, and then at the end, um, we're going to open it up for questions, and hopefully I can answer all the questions that you guys might have about what it's like to be a writer. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with you right now. It's a high-tech world. Start screen share. Okay. Is it working? I can see your screen. All right, sweet. Okay, so like I said, my name is Jill Williamson, and there are a bunch of my books. Um, but what I want to talk to you guys today about is tell you. Well, I'm sure there's that if you're watching this, you're interested in writing. Maybe you're a reader, or maybe you just like stories, and you're more of a movie watcher. Um, did you know, those of you movie watchers probably know, how many books um, were turned into movies? So those favorite movies you have started out as a book, like maybe The Wizard of Oz that became a movie. Um, we can name so many of them, and there's a ton right now that were actually young adult books, like The Maze Runner and Hunger Games and Twilight and Harry Potter and Percy Jackson, and I could go on and on. There's a lot of movies that started out as a book that someone wrote. Um, and I'm hoping that there's also some writers out there watching this right now who are writing their own stories. Um, I grew up in Alaska. Isn't it pretty? I did not want to be a writer when I grew up. I was a daydreamer. I grew up in a house that didn't have electricity or running water, and so I read books all the time, and I daydreamed all the time about what it would be like to live somewhere else, as probably many young people do. Um, so I read all the time, and what I really dreamed about being back then was a fashion designer. I was really into clothing, um, mostly because my mom bought a lot of our stuff at the thrift hand store, and I was not wanting to wear things exactly as they were bought. So I remodeled them, and I I could do a, I could do it really well, and it was something that I liked, and I knew I was good at, and so I chased that dream all the way to New York City. Um, met my husband in college and made a deal that we would go to New York so that I could finish my fashion degree and he wanted to direct me. So we went to New York with the deal that afterwards we would move to Los Angeles. So here I am having graduated from Radio City Music Hall in Manhattan from my fashion, um, the Fashion Institute of Technology and off we went to Los Angeles to chase our dreams. Um, it was about five years working in the fashion industry. I worked for two different companies and both were quite similar. Um, it was kind of like this. If you guys ever read this book or seen this movie, The Devil Wears Prada, it was a very competitive industry to work in and very cutthroat. And um, I just, it wasn't a good fit for my personality. I'm not a good um, minion, I guess. I didn't like being treated like I was, like I was nothing more than than a slave kind of <laughs> and it was hard it was hard because I had gone to school for a creative area and I wasn't getting to do it in my jobs in both of the places I worked I was in charge of of getting coffee and ordering things and answering phones and and none of the designing things I'd hoped for and it was a hard thing to understand but I learned it and I understood that if I wanted to be a fashion designer it was going to take many more years of trying to figure out how to make the right connections and work my way up the ladder or I could try to start my own business but either way it wasn't quite 
the way I had imagined it in my head all those years ago back in Alaska. So my husband was having a very similar experience in in the movie industry. He we didn't know anyone, and in Hollywood it's all you, it's all who you know. So he didn't know anyone, and he ended up getting a job as a as a tour guide at Paramount Studios, which he enjoyed for a while, but um, it, it was also a hard industry and cutthroat, and, and you had to be a minion, and, and we were both at that place in our career where we were trying to decide if we wanted to, to keep at this thing or, or step back and, and reevaluate our goals. And so we did that. We thought about it, and we realized that our dreams that we wanted so badly were not everything we thought they'd be. We, we didn't really understand as as teenagers and college students what we were getting into which is why I highly recommend internships <laughs> however both of us didn't have internships in college so we found out that that these weren't industries we loved and we wanted to try something different so my husband went back to school and I um, at that time was expecting our first child so I thought I'm gonna take some time off and stay home so, so I did and there's my boy and so I hung out with my boy every day and I watched a lot of TV when my husband came home, he'd say, hey, Jill, how was your day? And I'd say, well, on Regis and Kelly, they did this. And on The View, this happened. And on Oprah, she gave away cars. And on Dr. Phil, they were showing guys with tattoos. And so and so and so on and so forth went my day. And I came to realize that I was bored out of my mind, and I wanted to do something creative again. And around that time... It was Thanksgiving, and we went to be with our family, and my husband has a nephew who um, was wait, waiting up for the night before Thanksgiving is when this was, I believe, and waiting up till midnight to go wait in line at Barnes & Noble to get this book here, well, one of these books, the Harry Potter, it was book three, The Prisoner of Azkaban, was releasing from Barnes & Noble at midnight and Jake and his mother were going to go wait in line to get a first copy as soon as they could get their hands on a copy and I thought that was pretty crazy I thought wow who waits in line at midnight for a book weird and so I pushed it out of my mind but a couple weeks later I was at my library and I saw these books on the shelf and I thought I'm gonna see what the thrill is with these books so I read the first three books because that's all that was out back then and I understood exactly why Jake was waiting in line to get that book. And I, it opened my mind to a whole, new, a whole new idea. I just loved the world that J.K. Rowling created in these books, right down to the details of paper airplanes flying around the Ministry of Magic because the birds were leaving droppings. I just thought, she's really thought of everything. This is amazing. I should do something like this. And... There were people complaining about Harry Potter books being evil and such in my community, and so I thought, well, I could write a book that everyone likes. And if you've written books or read books, you know how silly and naive I was thinking such a thought, but I was a professional daydreamer, and I was not to be deterred, and I had a new idea, and I was going to go for it. So I sat down and started to think, hmm, how am I going to write my own type of a Harry Potter book that will be hugely successful and make everyone happy. And I tried really hard to overthink it and see if I could find a formula. And here's the formula I came up with for my first book. I needed a boy, teenage boy, who would be an orphan. He would be taken from home and put into some sort of a training facility where he would learn something new, which he would be good at. He would, at this facility, meet a boy and a girl who would become his best friends, and together the three of them would save the day again and again. And that was what I deter did. I, that's what I decided the formula of Harry Potter was. Now, speaking back through the years, this was not a good plan. But a lot of authors start out this way. They write a book that's very similar to or mimics one of the books that they loved, and that and not knowing what I was doing, this is what I did. So I set out and I started to write my book. And, oh, and I decided I didn't want to do wizards because I thought that was too obvious. So I decided to do spies. So I researched all kinds of things that had to do with spies, shows, movies, books, saw, saw what was out there, thought of ways that I could make mine different, and I started writing my book. It was so much fun. I had a blast. My husband would come home from work, and he would say, hey, how was your day? 
and I'd say, shh, as I was typing, my character Spencer's about to jump off a bridge. And so I'd found something to occupy my time with, something that I liked and I was having a lot of fun with and was creative and I was super excited. Well, my daydreaming, as I mentioned, I'm a professional daydreamer, it did not stop there. I started thinking about how successful this book was going to be, how it would make me millions of dollars, how, how it was going to be on bookstores everywhere. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, how's it going to get there? How, how, do I, how do I get a publisher to publish me? So I had to do some research if I was going to, to reach my, my goal. So I looked at the books on my shelf, and on the spines of books are logos. And that logo, each logo, represents a company that makes books. Just like the tags on the back of your shirts represent a company that manufactures those clothing, those clothing items, the logos on these, these books represent companies that make books. So, my goal, what I figured I had to do was get in touch with the people that make these books because I'd worked in the fashion industry and I kind of had an idea of how things are produced. Somebody out there is producing books. I need to meet these people and give them my staggering work of genius. And so that was my plan. So, I looked up some of these companies and I went onto their websites and these are the kinds of things that I found. Publisher's website, manuscripts, how do I submit a manuscript, can you send me writer's guidelines, etc. Et these are the, this is a frequently asked question section on a HarperCollins website for how to submit a manuscript to them. So, the answer is unfortunately with the exception of Avon Romance, HarperCollins does not accept unsolicited submissions or query letters. Please refer to your local bookstore, the library, or a book entitled Literary Marketplace on how to find the appropriate agent for you. Huh, well, that wasn't very nice, I thought to myself, but I didn't even really understand everything it meant. What was an unsolicited submission? What was a query letter? And What's a book called The Literary Marketplace? Well, after some more research, I found out that a query letter is basically a letter of question in which you ask a publisher to please look at your story. It's just a one-page letter. Unsolicited submissions, okay, submission is when you're submitting your story, you're trying to give it to them to look at. Unsolicited means they did not ask you to send it and they don't want it. It means do not send things without permission is what it means. So they're, they don't accept any kind of, not even a one-page letter, unless you have permission to send them a one-page letter. And I thought, well, why? That's not fair. So then I thought, okay, what else? It said, you could go to your bookstore or library and find a book called Literary Marketplace to find the appropriate agent for you. So then I had another clue, what's an agent? So I went and I found this book and I looked it up and I found out what an agent is. So here's the thing. Publishers have people called editors and you can give them your, you can submit your story to an editor who, if they like it, can take it to their, their team and try to get you published. If they don't want to talk to you because they're so busy, you can find an agent who is a person who represents authors, who is friends with all the editors and can get an appointment with them where you can't get an appointment with them. There's agents for all kinds of things in this world. Um, uh, professional athletes have agents to help them negotiate contracts. Actors have agents to help them get um, tr uh, tryouts and auditions for different parts. Um, musicians have agents as well to help them negotiate their careers and such. So um, authors can also have agents to help them sell their stories and negotiate their contracts and things like that. So I decided, oh, well, I must have to find an agent then. Great. So I, in that book, Literary Marketplace, has a list of agents, pages and pages of agents, and I was able to look through there and find some. So I went to their websites. And this is the kind of thing that I found. It says, McGregor Literary works primarily with established authors. At this time, we're not looking to add unpublished authors except through conferences and referrals from other clients. Regretfully, we cannot invest in the staffing needs to handle the vast number of unsolicited queries and proposals that have been flooding in. And so, for that reason, they no longer return unsolicited manuscripts sent to them, even if you send a self-addressed stamped envelope. Huh. Well, this also didn't seem fair. Basically, what they're saying is, 
they only work with people who are already published. They don't want any unpublished authors unless you you know someone. You know, you have a best friend who's Stephanie Meyer or Rick Gordon, uh, or if perhaps you meet them at a conference. And then they said they get so much mail that they'll just, they, they won't even return it. If you sent it to them without permission, they're just going to throw it away. So, again, I'm finding another slammed door, but there was another clue here that, that sent me on my journey, and it was through conferences. Through conferences. What is a conference? So, after some more searching, I figured out what a writer's conference is. And here's a sample of writer's conference. This SCBWI stands for Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. They're a professional organization and they have writers conferences. They're not the only one. There are thousands of writers conferences in the world, in our country, hundreds probably even in your own state, maybe even in the, in the city you live in. So if you're looking for a way to get published, I highly recommend you go to writers conferences. You will meet people here. You will meet editors. You will meet agents. You will meet published authors. They will give classes on all kinds of topics. And you, depending on how big they are, how big the conference is, you'll get your chance to pitch your book, to submit your book idea to someone. So I found out about some writers' conferences, and I thought, this is what I need to do. This is how I will get my amazing Spy Kids story to be heard by someone who can take it and get it made and give me my million dollars. And so... I found a writer's conference that was near me and it was a small um, day and a half one so it was one evening and then all day on Saturday Friday evening and all day Saturday and the keynote speaker was this man named Steve Lobby he had run a bookstore for years he had worked as an editor at a publishing house and um, are we okay yep we're good keep going Oh, okay. Um, and so he and he was now working as a literary agent. And so I thought this will be great. I will get a chance to to learn and talk to this to this agent guy who hopefully will love my idea. And so um, he taught us all about how to pitch your story to someone. And oh, let me go down. Okay. Basically, a pitch is just like in baseball. You're going to throw your idea out there to the agent or editor, and hopefully they're going to catch your idea, think it's brilliant, and run with it to the publishing house to make your book. Mr. Lobby explained that a good pitch statement has to have several ingredients. It needs to tell us who the character is. It needs to tell us what their conflict is that they're going to go through and what their goal is. Okay? So this is a great example of a pitch statement. An ugly duckling FBI agent goes undercover as a contestant to catch the killer at the Miss America pageant. Um, can any of you guess what that one is? I'll give you a minute to think about it and then I'll tell you. But it's great because it tells us so much. It tells us that the main character is an ugly duckling FBI agent. It tells us that she is going to go overcover, undercover as a contestant to catch a killer at the Miss America pageant. So it and it also, if you read that, you think it's kind of funny. It gives you a clue as to the genre. It's going to be a humorous, kind of a spy mystery thriller story kind of thing. Okay, this is Miss Congeniality, um, and that's a great pitch statement. So, and the, the other thing about a pitch statement, which I think I forgot to say, was that they're supposed to be short. No more than one sentence if you can help it. And so, at the break, at this writer's conference I was at, Mr. Lobby gave us the chance to come up to him and to do our pitch statement. And so when my turn came, I came up to him and I said something like this. Okay, hi, um, my name is Jill and I wrote a book about a boy named Spencer who is really tall. He's six feet, four inches tall. He plays basketball. Um, he's really good at basketball. He wants to be play for the NBA someday. Anyway, so he um, lives with his grandma because his parents are dead and he lives with his grandma and she's kind of strict with him and she wants him to join this spy, spy group thing but he doesn't want to but then she makes him and oh he really likes to eat peanut butter from the jar. Anyway, okay, anyway, so he goes on this trip to, to, to on this this trip to Moscow um, where he and I'll just stop there because if you're listening to me you might be cringing in pain as you heard me ramble on and on and on about my story and if anyone's ever asked you to tell them about your story you might have done something similar 
it's really hard to put your story, your huge story that you've been working so hard on, that has so much going on, into just one sentence. And even though I thought I had it figured out, clearly I hadn't. And when I did stop rambling, Mr. Lobby, his eyes had kind of glazed over. He looked at me and he said, Well, yeah, kids, they don't really like to read missionary books. And uh, I don't represent young adult anyway. It doesn't sell, so yeah, thanks. Sorry. And I said, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> and I walked away. And I walked out of the room, and I went upstairs. We were in a hotel. I went upstairs to my room, and I did this. I was so sad. I cried. And um, part of the reason I cried was because it's a very emotional experience to put all your hopes and dreams into one sentence, one moment where you get to speak to this one person who can make all your dreams come true. You put a lot of pressure on that moment, and if it doesn't go well, ooh, it's a very emotional thing. So, after I stopped crying and calmed down, I thought, okay, wait a minute. What did he say? And I tried to rethink it. He said, kids don't like missionary books. What does that mean? No, no, not missionary. Like Mission Impossible. Like spies. Like dun, 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 dun. Okay. He did say to keep it to one sentence, and I, I really, I went too long. I really went over the one sentence thing. And why did I say that thing about eating peanut butter from the jar? That wasn't important to the story. Um, hmm. And as I sat there thinking, I realized if I had finished the book all the way to the end, it probably would be easier for me to explain it in one sentence. Because I really didn't know how it was going to end yet, and I had an idea, but I hadn't finished it. I probably should finish my story. And then... It kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. I realized something. I had not at all respected this dream. And what I mean by that is, if I think about, if I thought back to fashion design, I learned to sew when I was nine years old, making clothes for my Barbie doll. Uh, my mom bought me a sewing machine. I started making my own clothes and remodeling them. I made all my homecoming and prom dresses. I was obsessed with fashion designers and their live stories. I could tell you the life story of everyone, Coco Chanel, Valentino, Donna Karen, Calvin Klein, Ralph Lauren, I could go on and on back then in high school. I drove people crazy. I learned to draw. I made fashion collections in a portfolio. I went to fashion school in college. I graduated with a degree. I went out in the industry and I got two different jobs. One was somewhat of a promotion over the other. Um, and I did eventually try even to start my own wedding gown business and I had pictures taken and put in Bride Magazine. I had achieved some level of professional success in the area of fashion design because I had respected that dream enough to put my time and heart and soul into learning everything I could. Even though I never became an actual fashion designer with the exception of my own company I started, I respected this dream and I was somewhat of a professional. But with writing, I had written half a book, I had copied my quote unquote formula from a successful person and I had tried to sell it for a million dollars without even finishing it. It was really it was really embarrassing when I thought about it then that night and I decided that I had a choice to make. I could quit or I could keep trying. And well, I've never been much of a quitter. And so I set out to learn to respect my dream of writing. And I pretty much for the next four years almost put myself back through a college of sorts as I learned everything that I needed to learn. I finished my book all the way to the end. I edited my book. I met a group of people and they read my book and I read their books. These were I got into a critique group in which we read each other's stuff and gave us gave feedback to how we can make our stories better. These were not my best friends and my mom and my grandma and my husband. These were other writers who were trying to make it in a very competitive industry. Um, I read every book I could get my hands on on how to write and edit. I wrote articles and short stories for magazines and then I could say that I was actually a published author. I was rejected again and again and again and again and I kept sending things out anyway. Rejection makes you a better writer. It's an important part of the journey. And I started sending my book out and I got requests for the full and I was getting closer and closer and closer and eventually I did get a book published. It wasn't my first book. It wasn't The Spy Kids. It was the sixth book I wrote um, and that was the first one I had published. One of the things I learned that I love is a quote from Michael Crichton, who was a very famous, who was a very famous author and entertainer, is that books aren't written, they're rewritten, including your own. 
It's one of the hardest things to accept, especially after the 7th rewrite. Hasn't quite done it. And so, armed with that knowledge of my story, I want to tell you guys a little bit about how you can come up with ideas. Here are some, here are some ways. First of all, ideas are everywhere. You could just look around and think of something to write about. Um, oftentimes when I have this talk, I'm in a classroom and I can look out and see you know, oh, there's a girl wearing leopard print shoes. Maybe she's a chameleon. And then I could start daydreaming a story about a girl who's a chameleon. So ideas are everywhere. Um, another way you could come up with ideas is to combine two completely unrelated things. Like um, this is an idea from Stephen King's book, kind of how he started out coming up with ideas. And his example was murder and mayhem and prom, which when you combine those is his very first book that was published called Carrie kind of a scary book. I don't know if I recommend it. Um, another one you could you so you could think of things like um, a criminal mastermind and fairies. You could combine those two things and that that's the book Ar Artemis Fowl if you've ever read Artemis Fowl. Um, another way you could come up with ideas is asking a what-if question. I did this with my book replication. I was driving with my sister in upstate New York and we were looking at um, we were passing orchard and orchard and orchard and farm and farm heading out to pick apples and I thought to myself what if there was a farm that grew people clones they could call it Jason farms and that's how I that's the thought I had before I started writing the book that ended up being come becoming replication um, you can also seek out a high concept statement um, I have a post on my go Teen writers site about high concept statements but that's things like if you think about Hollywood, snakes on a plane or something silly like that. Um, but there's a reason that people go and see those movies because it draws them in. And speaking of drawing, I like to draw a map when I'm starting to come up with an idea. Um, okay. Here is an example, another example of how I came up with an idea. One day I was walking with my son, Luke, in his stroller. And Luke is in seventh grade now, so he doesn't look at that anymore. But we came to a house that had burned down recently and there was a tree in the yard. The part that was inside the fence was charred and black like the house. And the part that hung over the fence out over the sidewalk was leafy green and blowing in the wind. And I stared at that and I thought, that is the coolest looking tree. And I ran home and I photoshopped it. And this is what I came up with. Oops. Oh, here's a Photoshop tree. Oh, there it is. Yay. So I photoshopped it. And I started my story with this tree. That's all I had to start. I thought, what if there was a land that was cursed in darkness, half cursed in darkness? Um, the next thing that I did was to draw a map of the world. And so here's the map I drew. And it was a little too big and it looked a little bit like Africa, so I erased quite a bit to make it not look quite so much like Africa. Um, I added dots. I erased some dots because I added way too many. Then I had to name the cities. Um, on the on the other side there, under Allentown, is a list of one of my ideas I came up with for naming cities. I came up with a theme for every area, and Allentown was uh, orchard. And so I made a list of names, half, of types of apples, and I used those for names of characters in that area. And each of the different areas I came up with a different three a different theme so the area of Carmine was a vineyard so I had words having to do with wine um, Berlin was an area that I used native Alaskan names and Inupiat names to be precise Barth I used Kenyan names and so this helped me give some different cultures to my world um, and so I played with this for a long time but as I did it I came up with things like reasons why people from Barth might be enemies to people from the, the Nehar area and when you draw a map you can get all kinds of ideas of conflicts and why people might fight over a, a river or a certain area of forest maybe that has wonderful trees that they want to use for, for building ships and houses and so I do that I did that and I was off writing my book um, let me go back up a couple so my process is I get an idea then I draw a map and start creating my world then I create some characters um, and I have a, a sheet from my website that you can download that shows you, shows you what I do for character creation. Um, then I write the book. 
I rewrite the book and I edit the book and that takes a really long time and I do those last three things all while continuing to create my characters more and my world more as things come up to me like I'll be writing and I'll come to a spot where I'm stuck and I have to go and create some more world information or some some background on my characters to be able to write through the scene and so that's kind of my process and I'm gonna end with a couple tips for writers uh, I'm you guys you guys should respect your dream. It's really important not to just think it's super easy to write a book because it's a lot of work. It's wonderful, fun work, but it is hard sometimes, and you want to put in the time to, to, to do it the best you can. Um, it's important to learn to write fast. It took me three and a half years to finish my Spy Kid book, and then I got much faster. And the problem was I was trying to make every line perfect as I went through, and it works much faster for me now to give myself permission to write an ugly first draft as fast as I can. Because once I get to the end, I realize, oh, I don't even need that beginning anymore. It's not important to the story. I've learned a lot about the story, and I can go back and fix it. So give yourself permission to write ugly and get to the end, and then you can go back and fix it. Um, it's important to finish a book. I meet a lot of people who are writing a book, but they've been writing that first, oh, I don't know, three or four chapters for the past two years, and that's as far as they can get. So um, work hard to figure out how to push on to the end and finish it. Um, then go back and edit it. Nobody writes a perfect book the first time without going back and editing it. It's very important. There's all kinds of mistakes you'll make. I mean, this isn't just like a five-page paper. A book is like 300 pages. There's going to be typos in it. There's going to be all kinds of stuff, and it's important that you, that you go back through it again and again. Um, then I say do it again and again. And I mean, once you finish your book put it down. Um, I don't recommend writing book two and three and four in a series if you want to be published traditionally and that means like find a publisher who will pay you for your book. If you want to go that route I recommend you write one book and then you come up with a new idea and you write a different book because it, exer it exercises your brain and your skills as a writer and it gets you kind of away from that project that's your baby. That first and that first project can sometimes really be attached to you and it's hard to put it down. But you'll grow as a writer if you can put it down and write a different story. So write different stories. My my first story that sold was the sixth one I wrote, so it was really hard to put those first ones down, but I finally did. Be a professional is very important. I get people emails from people all the time um, where they ask me, um, well, they ask me things, but they haven't spell checked their email. They've they've not use correct punctuation in their email. Um, sometimes they're, um, they even ask me things like, will you read my book? And it's okay to ask someone to read your book, but, but you got to be realistic. You're asking someone who has a full-time job to read a 300-page book. That's, that's you know, 10-ish to 15, depending on how fast they read, hours of their life. So only ask what you think is fair of someone um, when you make professional contacts and, and relationships. Um, Give as much as you're willing to get back. Um, and don't give up. This is a hard industry, and you keep at it. The ones who are successful are not always necessarily the ones who are the most talented writers. They're the people who refused to give up and kept at it and were tenacious and didn't give up. Um, and so that's pretty much my presentation. Let me show you. Um, this is my website. You can visit it at jillwilliamson.com. There's all kinds of information on there about my books, um, information for writers that you can download and look at, and you can email me through there too if you have questions. I have some freebies and contests. I'm always doing at least one contest. And uh, you can also visit me at goteenwriters.com, which is a blog for teen writers. There are three of us authors on there who blog five days a week on different, on different topics related to the craft of writing fiction. Um, so please come check us out and hang out with other writers and let's see oh and I have two reading books that might appeal to you one is for people who are building a story world for a fantasy or sci-fi story world you can go online and read or download the first several chapters and check it out and then I have go Teen, the go Teen writers book I wrote with my friend Stephanie Morrill and that is for after you've finished a first draft and you need to go and edit it it kinda helps you know where to start and what to do next and that is the end of my presentation so let me go back to Google and push my face. Thanks, guys. When you're ready, I have several questions for you. Okay. Oh, is my face back? Hey, there's my face.
Okay, go for it. Okay. Sheila wants to know if you used your experiences in New York for writing your stories. I have not written a story about anyone living in New York or, go, or working in the fashion industry. But one of the things that I think is important for writers is to realize that every experience you go through, you can capture those emotions and the frustration and things like that. And I've used the emotions and frustration in my writing in different things where I'll have a character who is in a similar situation. It's not the fashion industry, but but I can write those feelings of being overwhelmed, of being frustrated. And um, it's the same kind of thing people will sometimes say, um, well, I don't know how to write a bad guy who kills someone because I've never done that. And that's true, and I'm glad. But <laughs> you probably killed a spider, and if you're really scared of them, you might remember the emotion that was in your heart and the, at the time. And so you can grab things from your past and use those in your stories. And I've certainly done that with my with my time in New York. Okay. By the way, she also said that that picture of your son was adorable. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Melanie wants to know, how did you construct the idea of a teenage spy for your book, and how did you think of small details like the peanut butter jar? <laughs> um, well, those are things I probably shouldn't have shared in my pitch, but, um, well, like I said, I was trying to copy the idea of the Harry Potter formula that I had come up with, um, which was not a good way to write a book, but um, I thought it would be fun to write a story about... Um, a, bo a, a group of kids that got to go to different countries is where I started with that idea. I thought it would be fun if they went to different countries and they could they could um, learn about different cultures. And so that's kind of how I thought the spy thing would be fun. If they were in training, they would get to go and try different things, I thought. Peanut butter from the jar? Um, I don't know where I came up with that. Um, but it is fun to give your character weird little quirks like that and... and if you've ever licked a peanut butter knife, it, that, that, that's probably the kind of moment where it came to me where I was like, hey, what if my kid really just didn't use dishes? I don't know. <laughs> um, let's see. Ashley wants to know what is your best-selling novel and what's your favorite character that you created? Uh, those are hard. Um, best-selling novel, I can tell you, it's By Darkness Hid, which is my very first novel. Um, part of that might be because it's been selling the longest, but I don't think so. People really like that book, um, which sometimes makes me think, oh, maybe I'm trying too hard the more experience I get. I don't know. But um, but but that is my most popular book by far. And um, favorite character is kind of like telling a mom to pick a favorite child. It's really hard. Um, I, I would probably say Spencer, though. He is my spy kid. He's been with me from the beginning, and he cracks me up. Um, if you go and read a sample chapter of, of one of the Mission League books, you'll maybe understand his sarcastic voice. Spencer's books are first person, and so when I write them, I'm writing, I did this, I did that. And so I feel close. Sometimes readers feel closer to books that are written in first person, and so maybe that's why I like Spencer so much. Um, I do like my other characters too. but Okay. And Mikkel says, have you ever had writer's block? And if so, how did you overcome it? Okay. Um, yes, I've had writer's block. I think there's two kinds of writer's block. One is when you don't know what to write at all. You have no ideas. You don't know what to do for the next story. Um, and the other one is I'm just, I need to write this scene and I don't want to, or I'm too lazy to, or I'm too annoyed that it's going to be hard work and I'm procrastinating kind of a writer's block. Um, the first type, the I don't know what kind of story to write, I don't that one doesn't happen to me very often. More so it's a it's a writing crisis where I can't decide between my ideas which one will, would be the best, which one might sell the best. It's I kind of get stuck like that. But if you have that problem, I think you just need to spend more time brainstorming um, and trying to find a way to come up with an idea that you love. Um, sometimes it's because you don't love your idea enough. You haven't spent enough time getting to know who your characters might be and getting excited about them because often when you're excited about something you're excited to, to spend time with it and work on it and if you're not excited about homework or whatever you don't want to do it so figure out ways that you can get yourself excited about what you need to work on um, as far as procrastination goes especially for me I'm writing books that I've already signed contracts for and I have a deadline for and I said I would turn it in so even though I might have a hard scene in front of me I have to write this book and get it done by a certain day 
and therefore I either have to force myself to write the scene even when it's hard just one sentence at a time um, which is hard but I've done it another thing I can do is skip ahead and write a scene I'm excited about that's in, that's in the future of the story just so that I can keep getting words written every day and then I can take a break and go do dishes or go on a drive and think about that scene that I'm stuck on and a lot of times I can come up with why I'm stuck on it sometimes something happened previously that set the scene up that didn't work very well and if I change that it might fix everything so sometimes to get through I just have to brainstorm my way out of it okay <clears throat> Ashley wanted to add that she also loves Harry Potter and the Devil Wears Prada she texted that after you answered the question um, someone who didn't identify themselves uh, but from a 727 area code wants to know would you ever choose to be something than an author if so what um, I don't think so. The only thing I might tr like to try would be writing screenplays, but I know how hard they are to write. It, they're just as hard to write as, as a book is. Maybe a little bit easier if you already know how to write books and you work your way backwards because you have to learn to write less. You're not supposed to put description in. You're not supposed to boss the director and the actors around. It's supposed to be very, very clear cut. But I know I'd have to spend a good three-ish years practicing screenwriting before I'd be anywhere near prepared to respect that dream enough to do it. But I think it would be fun. But again, that's just another form of writing. I, I think writing is writing is for me. It's a, it's a good fit for my personality. Okay. Um, in the beginning you mentioned books being made into movies. Do you have any favorites besides Harry Potter? Mm, I love the Harry Potter movies. I love the Lord of the Ring movies. Those, I think they did a pretty good job. Not as big a fan of the Hobbit. I don't know why they made so many movies. Um, let's see. Also, I love, I love the Pride and Prejudice, the uh, movie. I love the um, the Emma one with Gwyneth Paltrow. I love Jane Austen stuff, so I'll usually like. It. Oh, I love Anne of Green Gables. Um, oftentimes the movie will disappoint me though, but those ones I mentioned I actually really, really liked. It's hard. Um, when you start writing a book, do you know how the book is going to end, or do you just kind of write it as you go? Most of the time I know how the book is going to end, vaguely anyways, um, and I try to get there. I like to give myself kind of a map, so I'm a bit of an outlining person. There's different kinds of writers. Some writers will say they are a seat of the pants writer or, or short, a short version is panther. Um, those kind of people like to just sit in the chair and create as they go and see where the story takes them. Um, then there's the outliners, people who like to really plan out every chapter, every scene. I'm kind of a cross between the two. I like to plan out every chapter and what I think are the most important scenes when I think about the three-act structure. Do I have an inciting incident? Do I have a midpoint twist? All those things. And then I'll sit down and kind of see to the pants right through each chapter and, and find my way. But I have a plan of where I'm going to be at the end. Otherwise, I think I get too lost. I have uh, three more questions unless someone else texts in at 813-862-1353. Um, Pasco Eskel wants to know, what advice do you have for students today for being a successful writer? Um, well, I kind of said some of those in my talk, but I will, let's see. Um, be consistent. Try to learn to write every day, even if it's just a little bit, even if it's only a paragraph. One of the things we do on Go Teen Writers every so often is we, we do what's called the 100 for 100. So teens sign up to commit to writing 100 words a day for 100 days in a row on whatever story they're working on. And that's about a paragraph, maybe two paragraphs. Um, but it gets you into the habit of writing a little bit every day. And it doesn't have to be much because it'll add up. Before you know it, you'll have a story. Um, so do that and force yourself to finish that book all the way to the end. I really love National Novel Writing Month, which is going on right now in November, every November. Um, they call it NaNoWriMo, National Novel Writing Month. And this is a, a, a website in which you can sign up to try to write a book in one month. And I did NaNoWriMo for my book replication, and it taught me to write fast. And you have to try to write 50,000 words in a month, and it's crazy scary the first time you do it. But it teaches you to write fast and ugly and messy just to get it done. And you'll learn when you when you get there that 
oh wow, that was better than trying to make everything perfect as you go. So I'm a high, I highly recommend writing that book to the end as fast as you can and giving yourself permission to have it not be perfect because you can go back and fix it later. Um, so those are my, my biggest ones. Um, I have heard of that National Writing Month. I have tried the National Poetry Writing Month, um, and I didn't stick with it, but I thought that that would be easier for me to commit to writing a poem a day versus, you know, thousands of, of words. Um, okay, we're almost out of time, but I have two last questions. Um, one is, do you have an opinion about fan fiction? Um, I never wrote fan fiction. But I think it's a great thing for writers. Um, there's been some successful authors who started there. I think it's great because if you're if you want to write books but you're having a really hard time getting excited about them, you might try fan fiction because you'll pick a you'll pick a a fandom um, that you love already. So you already are writing about characters you love, and so that gets you excited. So if you were going to write Harry Potter or Percy Jackson or Doctor Who fan fiction, um, already you're excited, and so that takes half of the struggle away from you, and you can practice writing stories with good plots and, and dialogue and things like that, and it can strengthen your writing. At some point, though, you don't want, if you really want to be a published author, you're going to have to set the fan fiction aside and, and go back to your own story. And your own story is going to be harder work because you're going to be making your own characters. But you need to do that. So if you if your dream and your goal is to be a published author, um, I think fan fiction can be great for a while. Just be sure to also put in the time to do your own stories so that you can strengthen your own storytelling skills. I think that's great advice. Um, Melanie asks, do you believe that agents tend to lean on writers who have the same interest as the agent does? Um, I wonder if she means personal interests or, um, well, here's the thing. There's all kinds of agents. There's agents that represent only romance novelists. There's agents that only represent mystery novelists. There's agents that only represent children's authors. And there's a reason for that. There's a lot of publishers out there and a lot of editors. And if every agent tried to represent everything, it, there's just, it's too much. They wouldn't have enough time to do it well. And so they tend to specialize in certain areas that they like personally because it's much better to have an agent who likes those kind of stories trying to sell them. I mean, if you hate lobster and you're trying to, to convince a, rest, a customer at a restaurant to try the lobster, it probably is not going to come off very well. But if you loved it, you're going to do a better job selling it. And the same is true of an agent. So you want to find an agent who loves and represents what you write, and that will make a better connection and then you'll have someone who loves what you write representing you and pitching your ideas and so I think it's important that you find someone that has those kind of interests whether or not you both you know like to drive the same kind of car or eat the same kind of food that doesn't matter so much um, but I do highly recommend writers conferences and if you can meet an agent before you sign with them because um, you want to find someone this person's going to be in charge of your career and so it's important that you it's really important to meet them face to face and get a feeling for them as a person and whether or not you like them. The internet can be can be really bland and deceiving sometimes when it's just emails back and forth. And so I highly recommend you try to meet that person face to face before you sign over your career to them. Okay, thank you so much for your time. Um, I've learned a lot from you and I'm sure that the viewers out there have learned too. I think I'm going to have to go back and re-watch. I was so busy thinking about questions. I, I need to go back and listen to some of the advice that you gave. Um, and I'm definitely going to share this information with our Writers Club because I think that it will help them as they uh, grow into better writers. Um, thank you for your time. It was a pleasure to meet you and I think that we are out of time for today. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me, and keep on writing. Thanks so much for coming. And we are off air.